So I will start off the presentation today and then Lisa's going to take over and then we're going to have maybe more of a discussion towards the end. Um, I'm going to actually just turn off my video for a bit just to help uh, with some bandwidth issues that I've been having. Uh, so um, I'll just show the slides for now. Um, I'll start off with the land acknowledgement as well. Myself and Lisa and York University are all situated on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tacaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation and UNMT communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga, the credit of First Nation. Um, I'll also start off by saying that these are not um, business as usual times. Uh, we're in a global pandemic and uh, part of, uh, you know, being able to present, I just wanted to like make space for that. Uh, this isn't sort of uh, usual circumstances. So um, part of me is a little bit sad to be talking about this project <laughs> because there's so much that could have been and should have been and that we hope will be, but uh, we're gonna do our best um, under the circumstances. And there is also a possibility that a child will come running in and interrupt me. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there for everyone <laughs> as well. I'm trying to change my slides here. All right, so we're going to be talking today about our Finding Flowers project, which uh, Risa just introduced. Um, it's a project that uh, cultivates um, knowledge and um, that we're looking at to think about uh, different ways of thinking about pollinators and medicine and plants and different relationships. Um, our slides, many of our illustrations on our, on our slides and our photographs are taken by Dana Prieto, who's here in the audience. She's our research coordinator and basically runs the show and tells Lisa and I what to do um, in a lot of ways. So I just want to <laughs> make sure that we give her credit right at the beginning. And I was going to sort of start by talking a little bit about my research as a conservation biologist and how I started thinking about why we needed to move into more of an interdisciplinary space and how those conversations started uh, with Lisa and I early on. Uh, this is part of our team. Dana is kind of hidden <laughs> behind Lisa there in the back. Um, and uh, there are a few people missing, but um, a lot of the work um, that we do has been done by students, um, by organizers, by artists, and um, Lisa and I really are indebted to their participation in a lot of ways. And it's very much a hands-on thing, which is why COVID has made things a little bit more challenging. So I started working on pollinator declines in 2004, and that's sort of the dark blue bar here. Um, and as you get towards um, the y-axis there, that's 2020. So uh, pollinator declines has continued to grow and be a hot topic um, in conservation. Um, year after year. I thought maybe it would be like this trendy thing, but really it has continued to be uh, something on the public's mind. Um, and people really are concerned about bees and ecosystem services. My own research has focused on assessing wild bee declines. Um, the rest of the bee in particular was one of the first species that I quantified um, the extinction risk for. And that species is now listed as endangered in both Canada and the US. It hasn't been seen in Canada since 2009 when I saw it at Pine Ridge Provincial Park. Um, so it's been over 10 years since it's been seen in Canada. And then I also helped with the Xerxes Society um, and Wildlife Preservation in Canada. We helped um, the, with the IUCN bumblebee specialist group. We helped um, assess all of the North American bumblebee taxa. Uh, so from that work, we know that about one in four species of bumblebees are at risk of extinction. Uh, these do need to be updated um, soon, and we hope to do that in the, in the next couple of years. But in general, we have a pretty good sense of which species are at risk of extinction and which aren't because of that work. I've also worked a little, um, a little bit also on the different threats. So we have quite a few species. Um, in Canada, we have over 40 species of bumblebees in Canada and over 850 species of bees in general. Um, and so I've, I've looked at different threats to, to native bees, including disease spillover from managed bees, uh, climate change, um, and habitat loss. 
So the main sort of theme is to try to figure out why some wild bee species are in decline and why some are persisting. And I still have research that is in this general area of understanding and trying to, uh, to manage landscape. Uh, but what I, in terms of how we um, start thinking about this project finding flowers, I, I have been sort of reflecting on all of the social, the human dimensions and challenges that I've run into as a conservation biologist in the, in the pollinator space. And um, my undergrad was really just like pure ecology. Um, I never really took into consideration like the humans <laughs> um, and how they all are, are involved in all of this other than, you know, causing some of the effects like climate change and that kind of thing. Um, but some of my experiences that I'll go through here have sort of shaped uh, where my research is currently going and um, part of why we're doing this project. Uh, we had a recent paper led by Nissa Van Weistertrip um, in collaboration with Friends of the Earth Canada. And this paper kind of um, shows, it, it helped prove some of the things that we had suspected amongst the public's understanding of wild bees. So there's a lot in this paper, but some of the sort of key points is that almost half of Canadians think all bees are endangered. And you'll remember from what I showed from the bumblebees, it was about one in four um, that are at risk of extinction, so not even in the endangered category. So um, people, Canadians think bees might be worse off than they actually are. Um, more concerning was uh, their, their thoughts around the honeybee. So more than half of the Canadians interviewed or surveyed, so this is a, a phone survey done by a, a polling company, around 2000 people were surveyed. So more than half of that the European honeybee is a wild and native bee. And two thirds of Canadians were unsure if this managed pollinator could replace our wild bees. Um, only one person was able to name a solitary bee and the vast majority of the people who were surveyed thought pesticide use and the loss of flowers were the most important threats to our wild bees. So this really points to some of the disconnect that I've kind of been thinking about um, as I've gone through this and been working in this field. Uh, this is something that one of my PhD students is still working on. Uh, so Hadil is doing a literature review on the conservation, uh, sorry, the pollinator decline literature. And um, the key take home from this is that the number of studies in the past 10 years really have come out of the UK and the US. So there's not a lot from the global south. Um, so the bias in literature is pretty strong. And that's really informing a lot of our policy and the public's perception as well. If you look at the content, this is also really interesting. Um, again, this is all still in process, but um, in terms of the topics studied in these papers, really pesticides and agriculture and pathogens are up there um, in terms of um, the most studied things. But the most surprising thing to me is that when you're looking at pollinator decline literature, so we're specifically focusing on the literature that um, is about pollinators in decline, uh, most of the studies are on the European honeybee and other managed bumblebee species. So they're actually studying common species that are actually not at risk of extinction. Uh, so there is, there is quite a bit of disconnect there. And in some cases we're using um, common species as sort of a proxy to better understand what's going on with at risk species because it's hard to study them. But in other cases, when we're actually talking about pollinator declines, we're talking about um, an industry and um, ways that an industry might be struggling. So uh, there's definitely some things in there that need to be teased out. In 2014, we, we got this new premier, um, Kathleen Wynne, and one of the first things that her government did in Ontario was talk about this Ontario pollinator policy. And it was like I was at the top of the world at that point, like I was studying pollinator conservation and we had a new premier and in Canada, much of the jurisdiction around conservation is at the provincial level. So to have this opportunity just seemed like such a great thing. Um, usually when people are studying conservation, they have to really fight to get their species on the public radar um, and, and then to have like a champion be your premier of a province, like this is unheard of, right? So um, the pollinator discussion paper was put out on our a public registry and it actually got the most comments that any environmental issue has ever gotten since the existence of the 
Environmental Bill of Rights Public Registry. So it got over 52,000 comments. And this is still the highest commented on item um, since um, Ford's change to the cap and trade program got um, maybe the second highest amount of comments, but this is still up there in terms of comments. Hey, Sheila, uh, but, sorry to interrupt you really quickly, but there's a lot of comments that there's feedback from your computer. Do you have headphones by chance that maybe would help not pick that up? I actually am wearing headphones. <laughs> oh, okay. Are, is, is, do you have two sound sources? Like, is, is, are you talking through your phone and then you have the sound from the computer happening too? Sorry. Okay. Um, I do like my my fan on my computer is very loud. Okay, that's it. That's all. That's what it is. It's just your fan. Just trying to see if I can switch my speaker. I don't see an option to switch it to my headphones. Normally, if you click on the arrow next to the mute option, you can select your microphone. Yeah. Microphone. See. Is that better? Unfortunately, Unfortunately, it's the same. Why don't we go ahead and finish your presentation and maybe while Lisa's speaking, we can try to troubleshoot yours. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know. It's a bit better now. I don't know what you're doing. It's a bit better. Uh, all right. I'm trying to like move away from the computer <laughs> physically. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. If that works. Um, oh, that's actually a lot better. Thanks, Sheila. Okay. Let me share screen again. Okay. Okay. So uh, this policy was really interesting to me because it um, showed that there was intense public support, like the most intense public support um, that I've seen. <laughs> um, but there was a lot of lobby groups that came into play and I kind of was naive in thinking that maybe like the scientists would have a big voice and that some of the policy would actually follow um, the science. Um, but what ended up happening was that the NGOs, the beekeeping companies, um, there was a lot of dis uh, discontent between farmers and urban dwellers and all of that kind of thing. So there really, it, this, this um, really made it obvious that there was a lot of like um, power dynamics going on um, and it wasn't just going to be about the science and it never was and um, what the policy ended up focusing on was not what is actually causing the decline of our at-risk bee species and even now with our Ford government what was in place which is very weak is now even more gutted so um, it's been kind of disappointing in a lot of ways. Um, I have this paper here with Allison Nichols. If you wanted to check out, we kind of analyze some of the, the commentary around that policy. So um, yeah, so I'm now in this field with this intense public interest and some political will. Um, and National Geographic recently had a poll um, asking people on Facebook who they would dedicate their life to saving and the the b one out is like the vast majority of species or sorry of people <laughs> so um apparently this is a really important and interesting job to a lot of people but um there really is a lot of misinformation and so i've been thinking about my own research and who is it helping um and when you look at the pollinator policy and what has increased um, you do find that there are now programs for people who are homeowners to create pollinator gardens and spaces, um, beekeeping companies, companies that create uh, bee houses have been getting rich. Um, <laughs> this, um, remember that flow hive situation where millions of dollars were donated for this new hive that might be less um, harmful to honeybees or whatever when you extract the honey. So um, I've just been sort of thinking about where this is all going. Um, and what's not talked about is, of course, uh, the, the implications for food security. Um, so beekeeping is a hobby. It's, it is a very like white male dominated space, as far as I can tell. Um, it also requires space and time and money, so a certain amount of privilege to be a beekeeper. Um, and community gardens, places where there's low socioeconomic statuses, they, they depend on free pollination provided by wild bees because people don't have time to have their own hives. 
Um, and then as we'll talk a little bit more um, about with Lisa, there are important medicine food plants which have co-evolved relationships um, with our native pollinators, which also isn't really talked about. And of course, if you're familiar with wild pollinators, not all crops are pollinated well by honeybees. Uh, we do need abundant um, and diverse wild bee communities to pollinate. So this is sort of how we um, started talking about things. Um, Lisa and I, you know, passed each other in the hallways and really had nothing in common because she's an artist and I was a scientist and <laughs> um, generally <laughs> it wasn't really a, um, a topic of discussion, like how could we collaborate with each other. But um, when this grant opportunity came up, we started thinking about how we could design an interdisciplinary program. So. Um, and uh, through my Libra Era Fellowship, I met Jean Pulfus, who's doing amazing, who has done amazing work on caribou with the Dene people and talking about uh, biocultural approaches. So learning about wildlife conservation, but incorporating different knowledge systems. So this is kind of uh, what inspired us, I think, when we were developing this project. Um, so in terms of the ecology portion of the project, um, I won't go into detail too much, but um, some of the things that we've done is when we're doing our native bee monitoring, uh, we brought out people like Lisa and Dana who haven't been a part of like natural history surveys and things like that or um, ecological surveys. Uh, so we're, we're doing this research together. Once we have our pollinator things planted, um, um, our different installations planted, we're hoping to have more of a community science uh, part uh, to it all. So we hope to have that soon. Um, and then uh, Shelby Gibson, who's a PhD student of mine, and, and Kennedy, who's a master's student, um, they're working on understanding mutualism. So what, what we learn is co-evolutionary mutualisms, um, but also could be thought about as relations, which I'm you know, thinking more about these days. Um, so they're looking at tobacco, which is a culturally important plant used in ceremony. Um, common bearberry and then the three sisters gardens well Shelby's working on the three sisters gardens and looking at pollination fruit set um, and plant pollinator networks so I think with that I am turning it over to Lisa and you guys can stop hearing my microphone okay thank you thanks Sheila um now it feels so silent without you <laughs> Uh, can anyone hear me? Is anybody out there? It sounds so, so, so I feel so alone now. Um, you know, Sheila, I want to almost, I don't know, can you hear me, everyone? Yeah? Yes. Sorry, nod, nod me. Okay, thanks. Um, so but I just wanted to uh, go back, or you don't have to go back to the slide, but I wanted to reminisce slightly in front of everyone um, about doing the monitoring with, with, your, with, your, um, with your researchers. Uh, and, and that was a really amazing moment of, of being able to go and, and observe and see, look for um, queen bees who are, you know, looking for their, the, the sort of location for their nest. So this was like early spring kind of, and, um, and uh, just the, the uh, my perception and, and the, my fascination with that process um, and how much I wanted to debrief on that process. Uh, uh, which so my so in just thinking about that in contrast, thinking about the kind of you know what our experience like Dana and my experience of doing that. So it was like you know spending an hour on this trail in Halton Hills um, and watching for bees, listening for them first, and then watching them. And um, but then the different ways that we you know sort of my perception of what I gathered from doing that, and then what I saw your group you know. Uh, gathering from that, the way that data was like, okay, what did you see, what did you, you know, and so it was really interesting. I think at that point, you know, I really learned a lot about um, the differences of our, our disciplines and, and the different sort of considerations that we have. And I think that those are things that always come up in our project um, that we still are trying to figure out how to talk about and figure out what it means. Um, so anyway, uh, just getting here I am, Lisa, I'm gonna <laughs> thank Sheila. Uh, finding, so finding flowers has so many dimensions and understanding and sharing information about wild bee pollinators, you know, has immensely informed uh, my thinking around, you know, paying attention to what is around me for one, for one thing and paying attention to uh, my own garden or the things that grow all around where I live in Port Severn. Um, it's really changed the way I, I perceive that space. Um, and since my work is, you know, most of my research is uh, art and curatorial work, which means 
making art, um, thinking about uh, uh, art, working with artists to create exhibitions and writing about art and thinking about putting together exhibitions that contribute to art history. Um, you can see that you know our 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 um, disciplines or our our research is very different. But I've also learned a lot about ecology and and through this lens, sort of science based lens, um, uh, just by working with Sheila and uh, and as an artist and curator, I've I have a studio practice, but I'm also interested in how socially engaged art projects um, is part of my work, and in turn is an approach that I'm bringing to this project. So, you know, this means like spending time and gathering people around these growing spaces to share knowledge and build understanding. And this would include the, you know, knowledge of plants, of medicine, um, and, and, you know, of pollinators and their roles from different cultural perspectives, like what, how they're regarded, whether they be butterflies or bees. So, and I see this project as a collaboration where we both learn from each other. And in some way, our experience in finding flowers transforms how we work maybe, you know? And I think that's something that we're still in the process of understanding and that we can inform each other. And this, um, we would be able to find, um, you know, that we find that this takes time. And especially, you know, we're in COVID now. So some of the things that we plan to do, we were not able to do yet. Um, so now I'm thinking back before two years ago when I would not have imagined, you know, and Sheila mentioned this, that my work and Sheila's work would overlap. I think um, thinking back to our initial conversations about what each of us do and my mention of my replanting, of replanting and researching Mike McDonald's uh, medicine and butterfly gardens at the Woodland Cultural Center and the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery, you know, really when I told Sheila about that, it resonated with her. And she explained to me in that conversation that butterflies are also pollinators and that her research, uh, her research on wild bee pollinators, you know, there, there was some kind of connection there. So the project began, um, the project, my, my knowledge of, of Mike McDonald's um, garden, my main knowledge as we entered this project was uh, his garden at the Walter Phillips Gallery. And this is the gate to that gallery. And the garden is between two buildings at the BAMP Center, and I'll talk more about that. And the garden is considered an artwork that is part of the exhibition collection and holdings. And as I, as I go through this presentation, you'll understand that uh, Mike McDonald was very dedicated to these gardens and very dedicated to research around the gardens and how these medicine plants connected to mainly butterflies, but of course other pollinators would be involved there too. You can change to the next slide. This is Mike at uh, Grunt Gallery. He was born in Mi'kma'ki territory, Nova Scotia, and he lived there many years, but he lived many years in Vancouver. Uh, he exhibited his work nationally and internationally. His video work and photography are in major public collections at the National Gallery of Canada, Vancouver Art Gallery, Art Gallery of Ontario, Kamloops Art Gallery, uh, Mount St. Vincent in, in Nova Scotia, just to name a few. And he also created a web-based work called Butterfly Garden, which uh, I, it was, uh, I think it's online. Uh, it was uh, taken down for a while, but I think it was uh, put back up. So like, just to let you know, he did do these gardens across the country, but he also uh, was a very well-established and well, uh, is a rec recognized media artist. And one of the origins, oh, can you stay back there? <laughs> one of the origin stories of his gardens I found um, in one of his artist statements he wrote at Grunt Gallery um, Archives in Vancouver. And it was also equity in materials in, in his artist file at VTape in Toronto was um, for many years, he made documentaries for the Native Brotherhood and about different challenges they had in, with industry and the state. He was also hired to document uh, testimony of elders who were, not, um, who were not mobile enough to offer their testimonies in court. So he, uh, he documented, he, because he was a video maker and back then not everybody could just pull out their phone and make a video. He had a special skill set that could offer the service in this, in this uh, in this regard. So he, re he recounts his work with elders as well as medicine plant projects in the Gitsan community. He was, um, so he talked about in this, this artist statement was he's talking about taking photos of plants in a, near, a valley near uh, Kitwanga, BC and butterflies kept landing on the plants. So he kind of talked about like how the butterflies kept kind of getting, jumping into his pictures. And so he showed the, these pictures to an elder and she explained that the butterfly would show him the medicine plants that he needed and talked about their medicinal properties and that the butterfly was connected to that. You can change the slide. So um, Mike is, is an important, as I said, video and media artist. 
And this is an example of one of his uh, video sculptures, uh, stacked television sets. Uh, and, and the images are all uh, images of Gitsan, uh, from the Gitsan community that he was working with and with um, Mary Johnson, Elder Mary Johnson singing a song. And these songs connect to the land, connect and also are evidence of their connection to that land. Um, and uh, also shows the different bonds of like harvesting, um, fishing, uh, berry picking, all of these images. So um, many people know about his video art installations, but may not be aware of his, of his work with gardens and documentary, all of which I believe can create a constellation of work that asserts, you know, this interconnection and relation um, to uh, land or in bet between the plants, between uh, li these living beings, right? And a different, uh, it's a different framework that to consider than, you know, it's different than a resource extraction and state sanctioned kind of permits for research, resource extraction from land. So we're thinking about um, uh, more a traditional, maybe so-called traditional relationship to to these spaces. And this this is what this work kind of offers and in my mind. And so does the gar do the gardens. Um, so rather than the colonial logics that we often associate with gardens and cultivation, um, I, I, and though I believe that those are also the similar logics that come to bear in resource extraction. And that, so some of the work that he has done in, in documentary um, and also uh, um, in terms of documenting elders testimony was about, you know, uh, keeping the land, uh, keeping control of land um, away, maybe possibly away from, or at least with agency in terms of uh, whether there would be resource extraction or not. Uh, you can change to the next slide. So I'm thinking um, in the next slide. <laughs> Sorry, there's a lag, I'm trying. <laughs> oh, it's okay, it's okay. So we might end up with three slides ahead. So I'm thinking about this and thinking about the possibility of the word garden, not quite doing the right work to signify these cultivated spaces that Mike created. In name, yes, they are medicine and butterfly gardens, but in their presence and practice, they rewrite a, a gallery, say lawn, because a lot of these gardens were planted around art galleries, maybe their lawn, their grass um, to indigenous flora that may have existed there previously at some point. So we can think about it as a kind of restoration. However, I would say that restoration seems to resolve. Um, you know, it seems like, okay, we've restored something, it's done, but these gardens, but that, but these gardens don't really resolve. I think that they, they continue to remind, uh, the, remind us of the, you know, colonial state um, and the colonial um, conditions that we endure. So Mike planted these gardens across the country and this map shows just um, some of them that were documented in, in some of the artists' um, files that we have. Uh, but we've had conversations with people who recall Mike showing up to install an art exhibition and, at, you know, say at a small public gallery in Saskatchewan and offering to put in a garden too. So, um, so I think there, we, there are a lot of undocumented ones that happened um, in the moment uh, uh, when was, cause he would travel across the country and tend to these gardens as well every summer. So I believe that there are many of these sites that are, are not documented. And those are things that we're interested in gathering and learning more about as we go along. Um, so this project, you can go to the next slide, is a lot about the relationships that were um, developed and uh, around these gardens as they were put in and also about the relationships that we can continue to develop and to build as we replant some of them across the country. Not all of them, obviously, but some of them. Um, and, and our first replanting of one of the gardens began with a visit with myself and the senior curator from the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery, Crystal Mori, to the Woodland Cultural Center. Um, and because we knew there was a garden there at the Woodland Cultural Center that was, uh, that was planted by Mike in 2004, and that was a show curated by Tom Hill called Natural Inclinations. And we learned the garden was not there anymore, but the curator at the time, Naomi Johnson, happened to be there when it was originally planted and she was, she was really, and she was now curator there and she was excited to do this replanting. So we decided to replant the, the garden um, at the Woodland Cultural Center and at Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery. You wanna, you can change to the next one. The, um, and can I see the next slide? Oh, shoot. Okay, go back. <laughs> okay, I had added a slide, but I guess it didn't save. Anyway, so the cattle, uh, maybe I'll skip this part. Um, oh, no, I'll add this. Okay, so 
Um, so this, this garden, the, so on the catalog of the exhibition, for that exhibition, Natural Inclinations, there's a diagram of the original garden, which um, you don't see right now. But anyway, <laughs> more, uh, it was a more, it's a very, as you, well, you can see our replant in front of us, right? So it's a very composed garden. It has multiple sections, um, very different than the one at Walter Phillips Gallery, which we'll see more of in, as this pr uh, presentation proceeds. Um, it's comprised of plants we might see in a pollinator garden that you might expect, you know, cone flowers and milkweed and, um, and then, uh, but what I realized through after a while was that there's, there was this uh, consideration to seasonal food for pollinators. So like it starts out with an earlier blossom, like a wild strawberry, and then later on to this goldenrod. And so the, each section of this, this pie garden, you know, each pie of the, gar of the round garden had um, a different plant that would uh, offer food at different times of the season. So these are material considerations, but also this is an artwork that functions in symbolic ways too. Um, and I noticed with Mike's gardens that there's always an intentional tension in what plants he brings together. So it's it, so it's not it's not just like oh look at all the beautiful indigenous plants. Um, in this case, he planted hops at each of the TP poles. Um, I think you can go to the next one. And hops are rhizomes, meaning their their roots like stems. Um, so they're prolific and tenacious. They, once you plant them, they're probably quite hard to get rid of unless you completely dig them out with them. Anyway, and they also climb. They are of, they're, the hops are of European origin. Um, they climb and so they were, he planted them at the base of each teepee pole. So they would climb up there and create shade. Um, so how might we consider the symbolism of this tenacious climbing hop plant? I'll just leave that question for you to link, think about. This is from the planting. Oh, sorry. You can, oh, yeah. This is uh, from the planting of the garden at Woodland Cultural Center. We did this with a local landscaper and students from my cultural production class. And through that class, we considered Mike's work in gardens, what we and what we can learn from this from his work and from his gardens. What stories do they tell? Um, and and in terms of stories, I'm talking about like what kind of knowledge do they convey? So this is the twin garden that we planted at the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery on the left. And um, sorry, the picture before was with myself, Dana Prieto and, and Jess Buckley, who um, are Dana Prieto's our research associate and um, Jess Buckley is on the right and is our one of our research work studies who did a lot of work with us that summer. So um, next. Here are images of two garden sites in process. So Ron, Ron Benner is an artist who also has done gardens for a really long time, really tracing a lot of indigenous foods uh, around the globe, looking at GMO uh, corn. And so he had an art garden here before the Mike McDonald garden. Um, he, had, he had his there. So he was here and he's a contemporary artist who knew Mike and he also donated, donated many plants to these replantings as well. He sourced plants from the, um, we sourced plants, we made a point to source plants from the Guyanase uh, greenhouse, a grower at Six Nations, which is a First Nation near, uh, nearby these two um, sites. So the one on the right is the Bradford um, garden and the one on the left is the Kitchener Waterloo and the Bradford, yeah, so these are us tending to it. You can go to the next one. This was, so uh, this is at Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery. And this was a garden talk that took place at the end of my cultural production course. And in this course, we connected the inside of the gallery with this outdoor space and encouraged people to engage with, uh, we created um, kind of a means for the people to engage with the garden space, even if they were just going to, inside to the gallery. Um, and this, we wanted to, we thought about this space as a kind of space of contemplation. And so what we ended up doing is um, we went through a process of learning about the plants, learning about Mike's work. We worked with plants to dye fabrics. And from those fabrics, we created these cushions that people could sign out at the reception desk so that visitors could sit with the garden. And then those cushions could be used for different events like this. Um, and the cushions had pockets in them with information about the project too. And in many ways, this was a start of using this space um, for mine and Sheila's talk on wild bee pollinators and the presentations by students. You can go to the next one. And yeah, I would just say that that was the idea that these spaces became places of gathering. These places became, and as we plant gar gardens across the country, we could start having these kind of ga gatherings with different community members. And we're working on that now. 
uh, with Ositiwan, which is an uh, artist from Indigenous, Contemporary Indigenous Art Gallery in Edmonton. And we're doing replantings at Mount St. Vincent in Nova Scotia. And we're also doing something with Bush Gallery. And um, so this is, we're hoping that this will be, these will be the sites for this kind of work. So not all is gar, oh, you can go back, <laughs> stay there. <laughs> They, not all his gardens are composed as circles with TP structures. We also spent a lot of time with the garden at Walter Phillips Gallery in Banff in the summer of 2019. And this garden is between two buildings and on two sides of a cobblestone pathway. As I mentioned before, this is an artwork as part of a collection of the center. And I'll go into more detail about our time there, but I wanna just preface that by pointing out that we came to develop this design that you see right now on the slide from a combination of the garden at Woodland in, in the plant composition and the Walter Phillips Gallery, which is one that runs along a pathway. And as you'll see in the coming slides, we planted um, the garden at York, we planted this garden at York University and we call it everything we learned from Mike McDonald's garden garden. So we, so details of this design are that at this end, um, so it would run, a path would run along this side um, and, um, you encounter, uh, you encounter this, it's like entering the garden, you encounter it uh, coming from the east, easterly direction. And the first plant that would be there is the strawberry, which is one of the earlier, uh, as I said, blossom, early fir first berry um, fruit. Um, and so that, that was significant in, 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 this, in its location. And I would also say that, um, yeah, I'll say something later about that. Okay, next. <laughs> And here's a midsummer image of the garden at Banff. The gallery signage explains this is not a French garden or a English garden, meaning it's not composed or will not resemble something one might expect in a public kind of a public kind of garden. Um, this garden has a complex story and seeds have spread over the years. Uh, rhizomes have nestled beyond their original planted space. Mike McDonald planted this garden in 1999, so it's over 20 years old. In other words, the, the, world, the word garden never seems to be right, the right word for these spaces. These are spaces of replanting, of remediation in the sense that the plants of this alpine region may, that may have originally kind of support, been supported by this space. And also um, there's more plants than he originally planted because uh, you know, every um, plant's uh, seeds move um, and they, they, they propagate themselves sometimes. You can go to the next slide. So during our time here, uh, we met Catherine Litalo, who uh, was the curator, is a curator in, in Calgary, an educator and a caretaker of Mike McDonald's Butterfly Garden at Walter Phillips Gallery. And she's there, um, the woman that kind of has her hand out towards the, the garden, towards the flowers there. Um, and from her article about the garden, she explained she approached the garden as a curator, wanting to understand the artist's intention and also as herself as a horticulturalist. Her work started by mapping the entire garden, um, finding out uh, the many types of plants that were there, which I think the list is over 100 now. She also found a booklet he had assembled, Mike had assembled, of uh, 14 plants for an alpine butterfly garden. And although I don't have time to go into the many details we gathered about Mike's garden here uh, during our time here, there is one thread that I do want to share. For me, this connects to the tension point that I, that I talked about with the hop plants introduced in, in the replanted gardens earlier in the presentation. A similar plant story emerges from this garden in Banff. The task of putting together a garden in a national park means that parks needed, the parks uh, office needed to confirm the plant's appropriateness to the integrity of the flora in this protected area. A longtime employee from the Banff Center told me a story one morning about this process of getting approval for the plants to this garden. He explained that the biologist from the national park approved all the plants except one. And so Mike had presented this list, right? And, and so the, the biologist said, didn't, gave it back, said everything's good except for this one. And Mike asked the official, why, why did he not approve the stinging nettle? And the parks rep said that plant is not, is not present in the park. It's, it's not indigenous to this park. We don't have it here, he said. And Mike's reply to this claim was that he, he said, you have, and I think it was the Ad red admiral butterfly maybe, um, you have this butterfly and therefore you have this plant because the butter, the, this butterfly needs that plant um, to lay its eggs on so that it can um, procreate. And, I, and that butterfly is definitely in this, in this park. So a couple of things that this reveals, it reveals Mike's you know, depth of knowledge of what was happening with these plants, the, the, the amount of research he would do around these 
around the spaces that he he worked in to make these gardens that these gardens were not just like a kind of um, they were not just a prescription they were not just um, uh, you know that they had they were very thoughtful in, in their in their um, installation and placement and um, and it was a response to the, the to place right and so um, uh, so this really was exciting to me because uh, it it confirmed that it, you know that this long term to me it, it confirmed his his deep knowledge of what he was doing and also it confirmed that his project was that that this this kind of knowledge he was sharing across all of the gardens he was doing. So Lisa, um, your time's almost up, but you can go a little bit longer just because I'm having my questions. Okay, I just wanted to let you know. Thanks. I don't have too much more to say, but. That was my bulk of things. But anyway, go to the next slide. I'm trying. That's okay. So this is a project. Um, so from while we were in Banff, we also learned about this project uh, by C. Weiss and Anne Riley uh, called uh, Soundtrack for the Radical Love of Butterflies. And this was a work that they did um, in response to the garden there, Mike McDonald's uh, Butterfly Medicine and Butterfly Gardens. And um, they brought together two spirit and female identified artists to talk about projects of social transformation, linking to the concept of what they called butterfly medicine. So this project has been inspirational in terms of thinking about socially engaged artwork that takes place around these, these spaces. Um, and, and also I've, we've been in contact and conversation about, about this, our ongoing project with them and their work too in, in terms of planting. You can go to the next slide. And we've taken what we've learned back to our, our garden at York, which is called the Maloka Garden. And as I mentioned before, that, that pathway garden that we had designed, you can go to the next slide. Um, the garden, the pathway design um, is something that we uh, planted at, um, at Maloka. And our garden has was so ungarden-like that it was mowed over by our grounds, <laughs> York grounds people. But something that we did learn. So this is the garden called Everything We Learned from Mike McDonald's Garden. Garden, um, and uh, so even though it was mowed over and it just somehow dismantled um, because COVID had a certain level of neglect of it, but also had a certain level of over attention to the space by you know being mowed down. Um, what I realized is that we continue to learn that how these perennial communities prevail and like a lot of the plants are coming back even though they had a haircut. We had um, hoped to engage different artists in these garden space. Here's the artists. Yep, you can go to the next one, Sheila. Uh, here are the artists from the collective Ron Grupa. Um, they toured this learning garden uh, in that, that fall um, with the intention to come back. Uh, so it's the fall of 2019 with the intention of coming back this past fall in 2020. And they were gonna grow, a, um, they were gonna use some of the garden plots and be near our our everything we learned from Mike McDonald's garden garden but of course COVID happened so we weren't able to do that you can go to the next one so as COVID came up we turned our focus from medicine plants and um, a little bit from Mike McDonald's garden more to um, to um, looking at the urgencies of access to food and you can go to the next slide in the context of this we um, we started we decided that we could share we wanted to share resources with uh, active food gardening initiatives that are POC or indigenous led and with whom we have been, you know, kind of in contact with in the past. So this is a garden of, uh, in the community of Beausoleil First Nation at Christian Island. Um, and that was one of a few different uh, gardens that we contributed to uh, monetarily, like helping to, for seed access and making sure they had some, some equipment for irrigation and things like that. So we kind of turned our focus to helping with uh, food, food cultivation as a response. And we're, we're working on a website that will connect all of the gardens that we replant and also the communi our community connections that we've made through this COVID time. Um, so this is the first page that has, the site's not finished, but it's looking pretty fancy. <laughs> and I wanted to say that uh, we also, in, I think in, in part because of COVID, we moved online and we have had this um, series called Me Gym, Food as Relations, and it has run through the uh, fall semester with four episodes or four sessions. And we have three sessions this semester. Um, and the next one is February 23rd 
Um, and if maybe somebody can put drop that into the into the chat so people can join us. Uh, we have two more. So one's um, in February 23rd and the other one's March 16th. And it's all around uh, food as relations, but also this semester has been a lot about food, about gardens and gardens as art, but also gardens as remediation. And um, yeah, it's been great. So you can go to the next one. And yeah, if you want to connect with us or follow us, we have uh, some presence out there. We have an email and we have an Instagram and a Facebook uh, presence. So you can follow our project and see what we're doing and even learn more about it. And I think there might be one more slide. Yeah, thank you, miigwech. Sorry if I was over, <laughs> that's pretty close. <laughs> Sheila, do you, do you also have a, a few slides left? Is that? No, nope, we're good for questions. Okay. Thank you very much. That was very inspiring. Very nice to see in a wintry, uh, wintry time and both, both, I think, emotionally and <laughs> weather wise. Yeah, so for sure. There, <laughs> there are a few uh, questions um, in the chat. So the first one is, um, from De Danica or Danica, uh, she wanted to know if the project focused mainly on bee and butterfly pollinators, or was there um, were there other uh, pollinators considered? Other types of in insects, birds, mammals, wind. Well, uh, so, one. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Well, I'll just say, just as a kind of thing, um, we were, th you know, just to, from our perspective, we were thinking of pollination expansively. So humans were, you know, thinking about not humans so much as pollinating uh, uh, plants, but this kind of idea of cross pollination and like uh, learning from each other as a kind of pollination as a metaphor sort of anyway, go ahead there, Sheila. Yeah, I was just gonna say like when Lisa brought to me like this idea of the butterfly gardens, I kind of had to like talk to her about how like plants are visited by like all sorts of different things, not just butterflies, even though the intention is a butterfly garden. So um, really, I think what we're trying to focus on, even though I work on bees and the gardens were originally um, talked about in terms of butterfly gardens, is just learning more about the connection that people have with the plants, with the animals that visit the plants, and just sort of more broadly. Um, in terms of like taxonomy, I would say we probably, for our citizen science work, we are going to focus more on butterflies and bees, just because it's a little bit easier when you're working with community scientists to do that. Um, but I think it's just more about the appreciation of these relationships that are that are being built. And, and it goes back to like my ideas around the disconnect that people have around what bees are here and how we rely on them and how we need them. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, you, you might, you know, notice like my section of the presentation wasn't like totally specifically about, um, uh, you know, pollination, but I think that there is a kind of in, in terms of our gathering and, and, and when we do have our community events, I think it's, it's a place for Sheila to come and for us to have conversations about uh, people's understandings of um, any culturally specific kind of understandings of the of pollinators roles and bees roles and you know whatever so and even like those that are those plants that are wind um, pollinated and like how that translates so there's kind of a good opportunity to share that uh, this next question is I think something you actually were talking about maybe a colleague Sheila um, I don't know if you can see that but the question is um, that you mentioned a collaborative project um, related to caribous. Um, I think that was through the through your postdoc with the Libra Eros, and she, the person uh, was looking for more information. Yeah, so Jean Pulpis, so she's an amazing scientist, and Lisa just put, I think, her website there. So she's based in Kelowna right now, and she's also an artist, so we learned a lot from, from, from talking to her, and she was a part of our application process as well with us. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Oh, here's one. Uh, can you re recommend bee friendly plants to grow in Vancouver? As a beekeeper enthusiast, I want to make sure I provide flowers that will help urban bees like the blue orchard bee. I am sorry, I'm really bad with like my cross country plant lists. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of resources out there. I think Polio Partnership has a regional guide that you can get from their website. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head the Western plants that should be planted. Risa probably has a better idea of that than I do. 
Yeah, maybe I'm not sure how the information can be transferred, but I'll I'll put a link in there for for that person's questions. Or if you want to email me separately, you can find me on the LFS website. Um, Judith. Oh, and the, yes, that's true. The DSF, the David Suzuki Foundation, has a lot of uh, a lot of information. I think across the country uh, about uh, pollinator uh, friendly plants. Yeah, I think there's a lot of information that are that's really at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I see a question there about how our project developed. But, um, Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I feel like maybe Lisa and I have different stories about this, but <laughs> it's always like, you know, high in the faculty whenever I walk past her office, which is pretty much every day because I have to do that to get to my office. Um, and then um, there were the protests for the what's to attend um, um, things that were happening. I guess that was what, two, two years ago when the protests were happening? Yeah, that's that right. Often. So I started like seeing Lisa, or I guess it was um, at least one protest where we, we happened to run into each other. And then this, it was just kind of interesting that the stuff around Mike McDonald was also inspired by the forestry and logging, but um, in the, the territory that gets in and what's what's in people. So um, we just kind of talked about that. And that's, I think, how we started talking about like the butterfly gardens. And it's just so striking to me that right now pollinator gardens are so mainstream and like, you know, the thing to do if you want to be good for pollinators because everyone's concerned about pollinators and it's across all political stripes but here we had Mike McDonald who was planting pollinator gardens as a form of resistance and trying to convert land back to how it was um, to get attention to have people see like what what the forestry industry was doing to that region of land and how important the pollinators and the medicinal plants were to those people so it's just really interesting how over time that perspective has changed so drastically. Yeah, and I think also, you know, it really shows a kind of his his um, acquiring of that of that medicine plant knowledge, right? Like, I think that happened over a period of time, which was really important to him, you know, and if we think about being sort of disconnected from the those uh, uh, that information as, you know, Indigenous people who, you know, that through the dispossession from land and things like that, like this is, his, his building of knowledge was really important anyway. But yeah, that all comes back to this, these meeting, these, this meeting each other at the, the, the demonstration, um, the protest uh, in support of Wet'suwet'en and like against the pipeline. And, and then, you know, um, just having a conversation and getting to know what each other do. Cause even though we're colleagues, you know we don't always know exactly what is it that, you know what is it that you do? And I still think we're st sort of still figuring out what each other does <laughs> yeah we had no idea when we were writing the grant it's like what's our deliverable like what do you do do you write papers like I don't know what this means to be an artist and an academic um yeah. and then so the other thing was there was also this new fund from the government that allowed for interdisciplinary research specifically for early career researchers which Lisa and I both were at the time are I don't know <laughs> yeah um so that was also an opportunity so we went for it as well yeah, and the it continues. Like I said, we we're, uh, uh, you know, it, we were interrupted. You know, we couldn't travel to. We were supposed to plant, uh, replant, uh, you know, at least three gardens last uh, spring, and we've had to put it off a whole year. Uh, but it's it's been really exciting. Like uh, at and so these got these gardens are in kind of art spaces, uh, like at, outside of art galleries. Uh, two of them are outside of art galleries. One of the, one of them is. Sorry, one of them is in Edmonton. Osetsi one is a new contemporary Indigenous art art gallery, and there's a there's a there's a a lot that will be built built on eventually. But it's right now it has no buildings on it, and so we're going to, we're able to uh, use that lot to to plant um, in, and it'll probably be more than uh, more than a, a Mike McDonald uh, you know medicine butterfly garden, but. Um, it's going to definitely be incorporated and that'll incorporate and that'll invite you know uh elders groups from edmonton uh, other artists different community uh indigenous community um into that space also uh you know houseless uh more street involved people that um you know so there's going to be like you can that's the sort of social engagement that can happen around this in 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 an artwork that kind of opens up in part of part of what it is doing is bringing people together 
is kind of creating conversation and exchange. Um, and then in Halifax, we're doing another one that is a replanting of one of the gardens he had done before. And that's at, like at um, Mount St. Vincent University. Um, and then Bush Gallery, which is a gallery um, that is in the bush <laughs> near Kamloops and uh, Sequetmuk uh, territory. It's uh, Tanya Willard's gonna take that on and, and she's gonna be planting that this, this spring. So, um, and that's gonna be around it. It's gonna be a residency of university, um, a bunch of different universities. We're having a residency with our students and the, it'll be probably virtual, but we'll have, we'll be able to uh, see Tanya building the garden. And, and so further conversations will continue. And, and that was something that we can, we contributed to last year, uh, Sheila and I, and Dana did a talk um, for that residency. So just to give you a little idea of where this is going potentially. That's, that's great. It's, uh, it's, it's such a unique project. I love this marriage of art and ecology, which I, I think might, might be really good for, for all of us. So thanks so much for taking the time. And as Sheila started out with in this crazy time, I know it's hard to, <laughs> to do anything, never mind a presentation. Um, behind this, so I thank both of you, both Professor Kala and Professor Myers. And behind the scenes, I want to thank Jessica Lattice and Jacqueline Chan uh, for, from the Center for Sustainable Food Systems. And if you want to learn more about the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC Farm, uh, the website is ubcfarm.ubc.ca. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, and yeah, maybe we'll follow up, uh, um, see more gardens in the future. Thanks yeah, so thanks much. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for inviting us. Meet you and see you again, Sheila. Thank yeah, thanks, you. Sheila. Bye. Thanks.